Okay, welcome back to the 144,000 Projects. This will be video 16, You Are Gods. Our YouTube channel is Rev9Video, and we just finished loading uh, 14. I've shot 15, and this is 16. So we left off at 38.27, and I mentioned the uh, two sticks prophecy about Ferris and Zara, and I was just making the point about Zara. So let's just kind of look at it. That's in uh, 38, so we kind of left off in, in the 37, and then we kind of know what they did uh, with their brother, uh, Joseph, and all that. Uh, so they sold them to some uh, Midianites, in other words, for 20 shekels, it says, and, that, and then they took them to Egypt. So that's kind of how that wrapped up. In 38, we got the history of Judah. And you should notice in 38 that it says the Lord calls, caused his two sons to die, are and uh, caused them to die, yeah, Onan. All right, so Christ, that's Christ, okay, killed his two sons for their wickedness, and then he made uh, basically uh, Thamar. Thamar, yeah. Yeah, well, it come about and produced the two sons, Pharez and Zerah, and that's in 38, the end of chapter 38. And Pharez means breaker, and uh, Zerah is sunrise. Now, Zerah should have been first. He put his hand out, and the midwife tied a scarlet thread. So that's where we get the story of the scarlet thread. And if you look that up, you'll find that's all about uh, Irish history, in other words. And uh, that's where it leads to, if you look into those uh, stories. The point was is that uh, when Jeremiah uh, left, they were supposed to go to uh, Babylon. Instead, they ended up going back into Egypt. And then you don't hear any more about that. And then uh, Jeremiah took the two daughters of, uh, who was that, Hezekiah the king. So he took... Uh, the and then there's a prophecy there, and we can't get into all that. But at any rate, so you can read that story. There's a lot on it, but uh, not much in the Bible. However, the whole story of Zerah would be that there's a whole uh, seed line of Zerah, who apparently uh, was in Egypt along with Pharaoh. And at some point, uh, his brother broke off uh, the stories that went across the Mediterranean and went out and populated the Isles, which is why you, the British Isles, in other words, and Ireland and some of the others. And that's why we have the uh, stories of the Isles, all the mentions of the Isles and Isaiah and others and prophecies about the Isles, speaking of Israelites in the Isles. And that's how they got there from Zerah. Judah. So they would have been Jews, if you want to use the same term. Obviously, they were Israelites from the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> okay, so at some point, they decided, well, you know, his brother <clears throat> was the uh, head, so he was a secondary uh, seed line and decided to go out and make his own fortune. So, all right, so some of the history recorded about the colonization of the British Isles is England, Scotland, and Ireland, and Spain, known formally as the Iberian Peninsula. In Iberi, it means Hebrew, and Hebrews, okay? So that's how we got these Christian Hebrews over there. And then we know the story of the Joseph of Arimathea, for example, and that would explain... If Zara Judah is over there in Spain and some of these isles, that would explain some of the comments in Acts and Romans about Greeks and Romans and other people who must be Israelites in the proper context. They're referred to as Gentiles sometimes. So see my PDF, seven Jews, seven videos, Jews versus Gentiles. Now, that would go all the way to 48. So let's just look through uh, some of the other things, just interesting things. And we know these stories, starting in uh, chapter 39, uh, what we should notice, though, even though Joseph was sold, uh, says the ever-living was with Joseph. And he became a prosperous man and was steward to his master. So that's 39.2. So that's how it starts out. 
And we know the story of how he ended up in the prison. But it says he was handsome in form, that's verse 6, and handsome in face. Okay, so we know what the, all happened there and how he ended up in the prison. You can read through that. But the ever-living, so in other words, Christ was with Joseph and gave him mercy and gave him favor. That's verse 21. So, again, starts right out, 39, 2, Christ was with Joseph, 21, Christ was with Joseph, gave him favor in the eyes of the commander of the tower house, they called it. Then in 23, they gave, uh, the steward gave everything in the hands of Joseph because the ever-living was with him. So Christ was with him, and it was apparent to everyone that everything he did, the Lord prospered. Okay, that's what Christ does when you just stick with Christ. Even though he's in prison and was there quite a while, Christ prospered him. But in 40, chapter 40, when you go on down, you see these others that ended up in there with him. They had dreams, and it said in verse 8, Joseph answered, Is not God the interpreter of dreams? Now, he respects God, which of course is talking about the Spirit, Christ, and all that, because he knew about this uh, Spirit from his Father, and so forth. So, you know, all the stories about Abraham, Isaac, and of course his father Jacob. So, Get down to verse 12, so we're in 40, 12. Joseph said that this is the interpretation. So first he says, God's the interpreter of dreams. Then he asks him to tell him the dream. Then Joseph immediately tells him the interpretation. Because God is with Joseph, as it's just stated twice, okay? Then again in verse 18, this is the interpretation. In verse 22, as Joseph had interpreted the dream. So, say the chief of butlers related the dream as Joseph interpreted it. Okay. Now you get down to chapter 41, verse 8. Now the Pharaoh has a dream. It says, but there was not an interpreter among all the his uh, scientists and people. Of course, some of all the writers, scientists, and you know, whatever they call them in yours. Alright, so then the butler finally tells him that uh, about Joseph, how he interpreted our dreams, interpreted the, each dream, and it happened exactly as Joseph otherwise, uh, in, in other words, interpreted. So, then Pharaoh called Joseph, that's 15, and he tells Joseph, I heard a report from the butler that you heard a dream and interpreted it. Well, he's looking for an interpreter of this dream. All right, Joseph answered, Pharaoh, may God return and answer a peace. So in other words, in other words, may uh, Christ give me that interpretation. He's hoping to stay out of prison now. Okay, then uh, Joseph, when you get down to like verse 25, he starts telling him this interpretation. And he gives the Pharaoh this interpretation. And then he gets to the end and says it's a double dream that confirms the event from God and God will hasten to effect it. So that's uh, 32. And he tells uh, Pharaoh, of course, to seek out a man skillful and set him over uh, so he can uh, administer uh, what he's telling him to do, right? Of course, he's kind of talking about himself there, but whatever. So he's in the Pharaoh. And it says the advice was good in the eyes. That's 37. Therefore, Pharaoh commanded his ministers to select some man with the Spirit of God. Well, obviously, he didn't have anybody, and Joseph is the only one that could tell him the dream. And everybody accepted that explanation. So then, 39, the Pharaoh says, I have perceived that God is with you, and there is certainly no intelligence like yours. Well, there you go. It was obvious to everyone. And uh, interpreting dreams is just not something they were able to do. So then we know the rest of the story. And then he has uh, this uh, uh, wife given to him. He's put in this office called the High Treasurership. Given uh, Asenath, the daughter of uh, Farah, priest of On, in other words, for a wife. Okay, it's 45. So, then we get down, he has two 
kids, Ephraim and Manasseh, so that's verse 51, so we're in 41-51. Then Manasseh means forgotten, for he forgot all, for it says, for God has made me forget all my troubles. In other words, after he has Manasseh, he called the name of the other one Ephraim, for God has enriched me, and that means, Ephraim means fruitful. Okay, well that makes sense. So then the, uh, everything happens as the declaration of Joseph had said in 50, that's verse 54, when he has the seven years of famine begin. So they did all the things that Joseph told him to do. So we know that. So in chapter 42, verse 6, Joseph was the protector over the country. Now, his brothers came to him. So in verse 9, you see Joseph remembered the dream which he dreamed to himself. So that was the dream about his brothers bowing to him. Okay. And it says right there, his brothers bowed to him and didn't recognize him. So that's verse 6. The brothers came and bowed their face to the ground. Right? So that's 42.6. Now that's going to happen again. So we, we know all these things uh, in verse 19. Do this and live for I fear God. So Joseph tells him he fears, fears God. And he goes through all these things with his brothers. Just playing games to, uh, you know, with them. Because he already. However, they uh, realize that, uh, you know, they're in trouble. And it says that God has done this to us. That's verse 28. So they, uh, they know that uh, the things uh, Joseph is doing for them is a problem. And they're being punished for what they did to Joseph. That's their uh, viewpoint at any rate. All right, so then we get down to uh, 43. And they're talking to the steward in verse 19. And then the steward tells them in 23, Your God and the God of your father has given you the money secretly. Okay. So, even his steward knows about God or Christ. Either way. And then he mentions, uh, Joseph mentions, talking about Benjamin. God showed mercy Show you mercy, my son. That would be verse 29. Okay. So he mentions God again. So then he uh, goes through some more stuff. Then Joseph, Judah, and his brothers come to Joseph's house. They were brought in. They fell on their faces to the ground. So that's 44, 14. Of course, Joseph is is uh, acting like they've uh, committed a crime and they're like, oh, we're going to be slaves, you know, because they have no clue what's going on. They think they're being judged by God. So we get to 45. Now they finally realize it's Joseph. Now, and Joseph, when you get down to verse 5, so 44, 5, he says, and I know that with fury and rage in your eyes, you sold me into slavery, in other words. However, God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has, so the famine's on for two years now. Okay. It's a seven-year famine. Five years more will not be plowing or harvest. Therefore, God has sent me before you to preserve to you a posterity in the earth and secure a refuge or a sanctuary for your lives. Okay? And the sanctuary, which he's given them, is in verse 10, Goshen, which is, if you read on, is the best of the land of Egypt. All right, so there you go. Even though he was in jail, he still reverenced God and didn't forget anything. I just uh, prayed about God letting him out and well, he, no, he comes out of jail. How many people go out of jail and they become second in command? It's like being, uh, well, it's probably a little bit more than just being vice president. Either way, second in command of Egypt. And he says God did it for him. So everybody recognized through all these verses we just read that God was with Joseph. God, uh, gave him these interpretations because no one else could 
could figure out what the dreams were about. Okay. And Joseph said that God's the interpreter of dreams. And God gave him this interpretation, which helped him get out of the prison and so forth. So all this, God was with Joseph. Amazing. Even though he was in prison. So there you go. I mean, you just can't. just can't give up on your faith. Either you have it or you don't. Okay. So then he says in verse 8, God appointed me as a father to Pharaoh, administrator of the house, and a governor for the land of Egypt. Okay, that's verse 8. Therefore, go to your father, say, your son Joseph says this, God has appointed me as administrator. Verse 9. You shall reside in the land of Goshen. That's verse 10. Which is the best there. Alright, you go on. For the best of the land, here you go, verse 20, in Egypt shall be yours. So, not only did he make him an administrator, gave him the best of the land to preserve a posterity, which is what it says now. I don't know if it says posterity. It actually says posterity in mine. As I mentioned in verse 7. Alright, so they get to uh, Jacob, verse 26, says he's also governor of Egypt. Okay. So then uh, they bring Jacob, this is chapter 46, and he first thing he does, stop by the well of oath, offers offering to the God of his father, God of his father Isaac. So there, obviously, he understands this is what we call Christ, and of course Christ is God in the flesh. And they know that, so that's why it says God, even though we call, we would use the word Christ. Then God appeared to Jacob in a vision. He said, Jacob, Jacob, that's verse 2, 46, 2. He says, I am here. I am the God, the God of your father Isaac. Fear not, go to Egypt, for you shall become a great nation there. Okay, well here's the first prophecy here about being a great nation in Egypt. Of course, this is a continuation of basically what started in chapter 12. All right, now it's carrying out, and Jacob is told by Christ to go there. Okay, I'll be with you in Egypt and support you, and Joseph will place his hands upon your eyes. Yeah, okay, that's Christ the shield. I'll support you, I'll protect you, and you'll have offspring. In other words, a great nation will become of you in Egypt. Exactly why he sent him there. So this was the prophecy way back in, what was it, 1513 of Genesis to Abraham. And now here it is coming out. So prophecy being fulfilled. All right, so went down, took the herds, everything. Daughters, all, of, all his race went with him. And there was a total of uh, 70, and that's in 40. 627. So then it gives you a list of the sons and their children and so forth. And you get to the end of that, 27. It says there's 70 of them that go. So then he talks to the Pharaoh and blesses the Pharaoh after he meets Joseph. And then you get down to the end of 46. It says, uh, 33, your slaves have been, speaking of the Israelites, have lived as cattlemen. That's what it says in mine. Grant to us to settle in the land of Goshen, for the Egyptians hate every shepherd of sheep. Then in 47.1, says, My father and brothers and their sheep and cattle. So they have, I, I, I thought about that. I thought, wait a minute, sheep and cattle, they don't, they don't, uh, can't graze sheep and cattle together, as I recall. They don't work too good. But they have sheep and cattle. I guess you have to keep them separated quite a bit. So they've been shepherds of sheep their whole life, and so have their fathers, and so on and so on. So you get down to verse 6, it's 47 6, let them settle in Goshen, and if they, you, they, if you know of a skillful man, appoint him as superintendent of my farms. So it's verse 47 6. Alright, and then Jacob. It says he's 130 years old. That's in verse 9, 47, 9. And you can read through that. 
So they're attacking the villages. Now, it says that uh, Joseph protected the priesthood by laws from Pharaoh. That's verse 22. Hmm. So there was a priesthood, and he married this uh, daughter of a priest, of Midian. So, obviously, uh, there were some priests. I don't know exactly. Uh, it, it, Israelite priests, or maybe speaking about Levites here, as part of the priesthood, I'm not really sure. doesn't really tell us. Okay, at any rate, get down to the end of, uh, alright, well, not the end, but 27. Joseph uh, settled in Goshen, uh, his uh, brothers, and they greatly flourished and increased. That's 37. And get in verse 28, Joseph lived 17 years in Egypt and he died. It was 147 years old. So that's verse 28. Now, uh, okay. it's kind of funny because uh, it's almost like it announces his death. Uh, I had to look at that again. Almost like it announces his death before he actually dies. He hasn't died yet because he's still got to give this prophecy in 48. And uh, uh, he has actually died here. But it gives you his... That he tells you he's only going to live 147 years, but he has, isn't actually dead. <laughs> it's kind of odd, but anyway, so you get 48, and then he blesses his two sons, and uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, and he says, this is Jacob speaking, 48.3, set up in his bed, Jacob said to Joseph, the Almighty God appeared to me on my departure from the land of Canaan, and blessed me and said to me, I'll make you flourish, increase your family, and make you an assembly of nations. Oh, well, then we just read what it said. He went to the well of oath, right? Well, if we just back up to what it said, remember? God, I am God, the God of your Father, right here at the beginning of chapter 46. They left. Canaan went to the well of oath, offered offerings. God appeared to Israel. And what did he say? I am God. I protect you. I'll make you a great nation there. So over here, it appears that it says, the way it's uh, recounted is that it'll become a great nation. And then, of course, he'll shield you from harm and that kind of thing. But over here, he relates it in 48.4, exact same prophecy, he calls it, an assembly of nations, which is where we get the idea of the commonwealth of nations. And then when you go a little farther, we're going to see it's a great nation and a commonwealth. It's both. Okay. So here he's just relating his own things that, that God told him, and he, he almost, it's almost like he changes the story. At first it was a, a nation, now it's an assembly of nations. Well, so the assembly of nations are a great nation? I mean, no, but not really, because when you read it, it's, it's more. So you see how the prophecy expands? You have to make comparisons of what it says in one place to what it says in another. Okay. So let's continue on. We're in 48. I'll give this land your race. Verse 4, after you as a possession forever. It's your two sons be mine. That's verse 5. As Reuben and Simeon are mine, but your children shall be, that you have after Ephraim and Asa, in other words, shall be yours. They shall not be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. Huh. So, their inheritance, that's kind of an odd thing to uh, do, but whatever. Uh, saying that, uh, because now Joseph is part of the inheritance, but he's passing that. Why would Jacob obviously take that and pass it to his two sons, but say any other sons you have later are not part of the inheritance. So that's kind of odd, but he said, 
God showed him this, so that now he's passing on a prophecy that God showed him. All right, so so Israel looks at his sons of Joseph, says, uh, "These are mine." But Joseph said, "They are the sons which God God gave me here." So he's saying, he's giving credit, giving him this, God giving him Ephraim and Manasseh. However, Jacob says he'll take them, bless them. Now he says his eyes weren't able to distinguish the two. But in verse 11, uh, Jacob says to Joseph, I have seen your face unexpectedly, and God has shown me your heirs. In other words, Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay? And what he means by that is, if you just look at the prophecy, is that one's going to be, become a nation, one's going to become a commonwealth, their posterity. So the two sons are going to be uh, have a lot of offspring, but in a different manner. And right here, he says, in other words, Christ has given me this knowledge. Enlighten me, in other words. That's the concept. And that's the concept of you are gods. When God gives you <clears throat> interpretations of dreams, like he said, that comes from God. When God gives you visions of your offspring and how they're going to uh, come out in the future... That's what makes you gods. Just go back to, like I said, Genesis 15, 13. He gave Abraham this vision of what's going on right here. That vision was back in Genesis 15. Now this is coming. So that's what God does to this family, starting with Abraham. And then now he's given Jacob visions and eventually he gives uh, this offspring of Jacob, the 12 tribes, uh, makes prophets out of some of them and gives them truthful prophecies because if they're truthful they come from, from God in other words and that's why he calls them gods because he only works with them he doesn't give it, just people all over the world just here and there and the, just pop up and here's a, a prophet from God that can tell you what's going to happen 400 years away you see it just doesn't happen he works with his family from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their gods, because he gives them prophecies, and he's never changed that, and never is going to change that. When you get to Revelation, he's still working with these people. They're the gods. They're the priesthood. The ones that, you know, accept. Don't reject it. Okay. So, we're in 48, 12, then. So, Joseph brought them. They bowed. For his face, Joseph took him, and then he crossed his hands because he, he couldn't see him. But of course, God told him what to do, and he crossed his hands. So then he blessed Joseph in fifteen, the God in the presence of whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. So he's connecting to God, which we know that Jacob, the angel, which the angel said he was God, making him Christ. So now he's saying this God, which is Christ, appeared to. His fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Okay. So then Christ was who appeared to Abraham in chapter 12. Right there. And to Isaac. The God who appeared to me from old and to this day, the messenger or the angel who redeemed me from all misfortune. Of course, Christ is the redeemer. Okay. And that's Christ the shield is really what he's talking to. All right. <clears throat> Bless the lads, give them the, my power. Now the power that he has was came from Abraham, in other words, and that power was transferred to his Isaac, then to Jacob, and then that power which we uh, saw was what Israel meant, power with God, in other words, was passed to the children. Here you go, he's passing it to the children. But he's talking to Ephraim and Manasseh. So he's putting them in charge, in other words. All right, bless the lads, give them my power. The power of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. So that's power that's passed down. Pour out their increase to the bounds of the earth in 17. Joseph uh, realized he crossed his hands. And then he says, uh, well, I knew it. Okay, in verse 19, I knew it. 
He also shall be a nation, and he also shall be great, but nevertheless his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his race shall become, in other words, his posterity, shall become a multitude of nations. And when blessing in that period, they shall say the blessing of Israel be upon you. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And they will place Ephraim above Manasseh. Okay? Because Ephraim meant, back up, fruit. Right? His brother meant forgotten, as in uh, once he had uh, Manasseh, he forgot all his troubles. That was the idea. Okay. But Ephraim was fruitful. <clears throat> but he blessed Manasseh above Ephraim and Ephraim above Manasseh, even though Manasseh was older. 